The Valley of Decision by Edith Wharton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Four, Part Six. Fulvia, in the twilight, sat awaiting the Duke. The room in which she sat looked out on a stone-flagged cloister, enclosing a plot of ground planted with yews, and at the farther end of this cloister a door communicated by a covered way with the ducal gardens. The house had formed a part of the convent of the Perpetual Adoration, which had been sold by the nuns when they moved to the new buildings the late duke had given them. A portion had been torn down to make way for the Marquis of Servino's palace and in the remaining fragment, a low building wedged between high walls, Fulvia had found a lodging. Her whole dwelling consisted of the abbess's parlour, in which she now sat, and the two or three adjoining cells. The tall presses in the parlour had been filled with her father's books, and surmounted by his globes and other scientific instruments. But for this the apartment remained as unadorned as in her predecessor's day and Fulvia, in her austere black gown, with a lawn kerchief folded over her breast, and the unpowdered hair drawn back from her pale face, might herself have passed for the head of a religious community. She cultivated with almost morbid care this severity of dress and surroundings. There were moments when she could hardly tolerate the pale autumnal beauty which her glass reflected, when even this phantom of youth and radiance became a stumbling-block to her spiritual pride. She was not ashamed of being the Duke of Pianora's mistress, but she had a horror of being thought like mistresses of other princes. She loathed all that the position represented in men's minds. She had refused all that, according to the conventions of the day, it entitled her to claim, wealth, patronage, and the rank and estates which it was customary for the sovereign to confer. She had taken nothing from Odo but his love and the little house in which he had lodged her. Three years had passed since Fulvia's flight to Pianora. From the moment when she and Odo had stood face to face again, it had been clear to him that he could never give her up, to her that she could never leave him. Fate seemed to have thrown them together in derision of their long struggle, and both felt that lassitude of the will which is the reaction from vain endeavor. The discovery that he needed her, that the task for which he had given her up could after all not be accomplished without her, served to overcome her last resistance. If the end for which both strove could best be attained together, if he needed the aid of her unfaltering faith as much as she needed that of his wealth and power, why should any personal scruple stand between them? Why should she, who had given all else to the cause, ease, fortune, safety, and even the happiness that lay in her hand, hesitate to make the final sacrifice of a private ideal? According to the standards of her day, there was no dishonor to a woman in being the mistress of a man whose rank forbade his marrying her. The dishonor lay in the conduct which had come to be associated with such relations. Under the old dispensation, the influence of the prince's mistress had stood for the vast excesses of moral and political corruption. Why might it not, under the new law, come to represent as unlimited a power for good? So love, the casuist argued. And during those first months, when happiness seemed at last its own justification, Fulvia lived in every fiber. But always, even then, she was on the defensive against that higher tribunal which her own conception of life had created. In spite of herself, she was a child of the new era, of the universal reaction against the falseness and egotism of the old social code, a standard of conduct regulated by the needs of the race rather than by individual passion, a conception of each existence as a link in the great chain of human endeavor, had slowly shaped itself out of the wild theories and vague codes of the eighteenth-century moralists and with the sense of the sacramental nature of human ties came a renewed reverence for moral and physical purity. Fulvia was of those who required that their lives shall be an affirmation of themselves, and the lack of inner harmony drove her to seek some outward expression of her ideals. She threw herself with renewed passion into the political struggle. The best, the only justification of her power was to use it boldly, openly, for the good of the people. All the repressed forces of her nature were poured into this single channel. She had no desire to conceal her situation, to disguise her influence over Odo, 
she wished it rather to be so visible a factor in his relations with his people that she should come to be regarded as the ultimate pledge of his good faith but like all the casuistical virtues this position had the rigidity of something created to fit a special case and the result was a fixity of attitude which spread benumbingly over her whole nature she was conscious of the change yet dared not struggle against it since to do so was to confess the weakness of her case she had chosen to be regarded as a symbol rather than a woman and there were moments when she felt as isolated from life as some marble allegory in its niche above the marketplace. It was the desire to associate herself with the Duke's public life that had induced her, after much hesitation, to accept the degree which the university had conferred on her. She had shared eagerly in the work of reconstructing the university, and had been the means of drawing to Pianora several teachers of distinction from Padua and Pavia it was her dream to build up a seat of learning which should attract students from all parts of italy and though many young men of good family had withdrawn from the classes when the barnabites were dispossessed she was confident that they would soon be replaced by scholars from other states she was resolved to identify herself openly with the educational reform which seemed to her one of the most important steps towards civic emancipation and she had therefore acceded to the request of the faculty that on receiving her degree she should sustain a thesis before the university this ceremony was to take place a few days hence on the duke's birthday and as the new charter was to be proclaimed on the same day fulvia had chosen as the subject of her discourse the constitution recently promulgated in france she pushed aside the bundle of political pamphlets which she had been studying and sat looking out at the strip of garden beyond the arches of the cloister the narrow horizon bounded by convent walls symbolized fitly enough the life she had chosen to lead a life of artificial restraints and renunciations passive conventional almost in which even the central point of her love burned now with a calm devotional glow the door in the cloister opened and the duke crossed the garden he walked slowly with the listless step she had observed in him of late, and as he entered she saw that he looked pale and weary. "'You have been at work again,' she said. "'A cabinet meeting?' "'Yes,' he answered, sinking into the abbess's high-carved chair. He glanced musingly about the dim room in which the shadow of the cloister made an early dusk its atmosphere of monastic calm of which the significance did not escape him fell soothingly on his spirit it simplified his relation to fulvia by tacitly restricting it within the bounds of a tranquil tenderness any other setting would have seemed less in harmony with their fate better perhaps than fulvia he knew what ailed them both happiness had come to them but it had come too late it had come tinged with disloyalty to their early ideals it had come when delay and disillusionment had imperceptibly weakened the springs of passion for it is the saddest thing about sorrow that it deadens the capacity for happiness and to fulvia and odo the joy they had renounced had returned with an exile's alien face seeing that he remained silent she rose and lit the shaded lamp on the table he watched her as she moved across the room her step had lost none of its flowing grace of that harmonious impetus which years ago had drawn his boyish fancy in its wake as she bent above the lamp the circle of light threw her face into relief against the deepening shadows of the room she had changed indeed but as those change in whom the springs of life are clear and abundant it was a development rather than a diminution the old purity of outline remained, and deep below the surface but still visible sometimes to his lessening insight, the old girlish spirit, radiant, tender, and impetuous, stirred for a moment in her eyes. The lamplight fell on the pamphlets she had pushed aside. Odo picked one up. What are these? he asked. They were sent to me by the English traveller whom Andrioni brought here. He turned a few pages. Mm, the old story, he said do you never weary of it an old story she exclaimed i thought it had been the newest in the world is it not being written chapter by chapter before our very eyes 
Otto laid the treatise aside. Are you never afraid to turn the next page? he asked. Afraid? Afraid of what? That it may be written in blood? She uttered a quick exclamation, then her face hardened, and she said in a low tone, De Crucis has been with you. He made the half-resigned, half-impatient gesture of a man who feels himself drawn into a familiar argument from which there is no issue. He left yesterday for Germany. He was here too long, she said, with an uncontrollable escape of bitterness. Odo sighed. If you would but let me bring him to you, you would see that his influence over me is not what you think it. She was silent a moment, then she said, You are tired tonight. Let us not talk of these things. As you please, he answered with an air of relief, and she rose and went to the harpsichord. She played softly with a veiled touch, gliding from one crepuscular melody to another, till the room was filled with drifts of sound that seemed like the voice of its own shadows. There had been times when he could have yielded himself to this languid tide of music, letting it loosen the ties of thought till he floated out into the soothing dimness of sensation. But now the present held him. To Fulvia, too, he knew the music was but a forced interlude, a mechanical refuge from thought. She had deliberately narrowed their intercourse to one central idea, and it was her punishment that silence had come to be merely an intensified expression of this idea. When she turned to Odo, she saw the same consciousness in his face. It was useless for them to talk of other things. With a pang of unreasoning regret, she felt that she had become to him the embodiment of a single thought, a formula rather than a woman. "'Tell me what you have been doing,' she said. The question was a relief. At once he began to speak of his work. All his thoughts, all his time, were given to the Constitution, which was to define the powers of church and state. The difficulties increased as the work advanced, but the gravest difficulty was one of which he dared not tell her his own growing distrust of the ideas for which he labored. He was too keenly aware of the difference in their mental operations. For Fulvia, ideas were either rejected or at once converted into principles. With himself, they remained stored in the mind, serving rather as commentaries on life than as incentives to action. This perpetual accessibility to new impressions was a quality she could not understand or could conceive of only as a weakness. Her own mind was like a garden in which nothing is ever transplanted. She allowed for no intermediate stages between error and dogma, for no shifting of the bounds of conviction. And this security gave her the singleness of purpose in which he found himself more and more deficient. Odo remembered that he had once thought her nearness would dispel his hesitations. At first it had been so, but gradually the contact with her fixed enthusiasms had set up within him an opposing sense of the claim she ignored. The element of dogmatism in her faith showed the discouraging sameness of the human mind. He perceived that, to a spirit like Fulvia's, it might become possible to shed blood in the cause of tolerance. The rapid march of events in France had necessarily produced an opposite effect on minds so differently constituted. To Fulvia the year had been a year of victory, a glorious affirmation of her political creed. Step by step she had seen, as in some old allegorical painting, error fly before the shafts of truth. Where Odo beheld a conflagration, she saw a sunrise, and all that was bare and cold in her own life was warmed and transfigured by that ineffable brightness. She listened patiently while he enlarged on the difficulties of the case. The Constitution was framed in all its details, but with its completion he felt more than ever doubtful of the wisdom of granting it. He would have welcomed any postponement that did not seem an admission of fear. He dreaded the inevitable break with the clergy not so much because of the consequent danger to his own authority as because he was increasingly conscious of the newness and clumsiness of the instrument with which he proposed to replace their tried and complex system. He mentioned to Fulvia the rumors of popular disaffection, but she swept them aside with a smile. The people mistrust you, she said, and what does that mean? That you have given your enemies time to work on their credulity. 
the longer you delay the more opposition you will encounter father ignazio would rather destroy the state than let it be saved by any hand but his odo reflected of all my enemies he said father ignazio is the one i most respect because he is the most sincere he is the most dangerous then she returned a fanatic is always more powerful than a knave he was struck with her undiminished faith in the sufficiency of such generalizations did she really think that to solve such a problem it was only necessary to define it the contact with her unfaltering assurance would once have given him a momentary glow but now it left him cold she was speaking more urgently surely she said the noblest use a man can make of his own freedom is to set others free my father said it was the only justification of kingship he glanced at her half sadly do you still fancy that kings are free i am bound hand and foot so is my father she flashed back at him but he had the promethean spirit she colored at her own quickness but odo took the thrust tranquilly yes he said your father had the promethean spirit i have not the flesh that is daily torn from me does not grow again your courage is as great as his she exclaimed her tenderness in arms no he answered for his was hopeful there was a pause and then he began to speak of the day's work. All the afternoon he had been in consultation with Crescenti, whose vast historical knowledge was of service in determining many disputed points in the tenure of land. The librarian was in sympathy with any measures tending to relieve the condition of the peasantry, yet he was almost as strongly opposed as Trescori to any reduction of the Tuscan constitution. He is afraid, broke in Fulvia, she admired and respected Crescenti, yet she had never fully trusted him. The taint of ecclesiasticism was on him. Odo smiled. He has never been afraid of facing the charge of Jansenism, he replied. All his life he has stood in open opposition to the church party. It is one thing to criticize their dogmas, another to attack their privileges. At such a time he is bound to remember that he is a priest, that he is one of them. Yet, as you have often pointed out, it is to the clergy that France in great measure owes her release from feudalism. She smiled coldly. France would have won her cause without the clergy. Ah, this is not France, then, he said with a sigh. After a moment he began again. Can you not see that any reform which aims at reducing the power of the clergy must be more easily and successfully carried out if they can be induced to take part in it? that in short we need them at this moment as we have never needed them before. The example of France ought at least to show you that. The example of France shows me that to gain a point in such a struggle any means must be used. In France, as you say, the clergy were with the people. Here they are against them. Where persuasion fails, coercion must be used. Odo smiled faintly. You must have borrowed that from their own armory, he said. She colored at the sarcasm. Why not, she retorted. Let them have a taste of their own methods. They know the kind of pressure that makes men yield. When they feel it, they will know what to do. He looked at her with astonishment. This is Gamba's tone, he said. I have never heard you speak in this way before. She colored again, and now with a profound emotion. Yes, she said, it is Gamba's tone he and i speak for the same cause and with the same voice we are of the people and we speak for the people who are your other counsellors priests and noblemen it is natural enough that they should wish to make their side of the question heard listen to them if you will conciliate them if you can we need all the allies we can win only do not fancy they are really speaking for the people do not think it is the people's voice you hear the people do not ask you to weigh this claim against that, to look too curiously at the defects and merits of every clause in their charter. All they ask is that the charter should be given them. She spoke with the low-voiced passion that possessed her at such moments. All acrimony had vanished from her tone. The expression of a great conviction had swept aside every personal animosity 
and cleared the sources of her deepest feeling. Odo felt the pressure of her emotion. He leaned to her, and their hands met. "'It shall be given them,' he said. She lifted her face to his. It shone with a great light. Once before he had seen it so illumined, but with how different a brightness. The remembrance stirred in him some old habit of the senses. He bent over and kissed her. End of Book Four, Part Six The Valley of Decision by Edith Wharton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Four, Part Seven. Never before had Odo so keenly felt the difference between theoretical visions of liberty and their practical application. His deepest heart searching showed him as sincerely devoted as ever to the cause which had enlisted his youth. He still longed above all things to serve his fellows but the conditions of such service were not what he had dreamed. How different a calling it had been in St. Francis's day, when hearts inflamed with a new sense of brotherhood had but to set forth in their simple mission of almsgiving and admonition. To love one's neighbor had become a much more complex business, one that taxed the intelligence as much as the heart, and in the course of which feeling must be held in firm subjection to reason. He was discouraged by Fulvia's inability to understand the change. Hers was the missionary spirit, and he could not but reflect how much happier she would have been as a nun in a charitable order, a unit in some organized system of beneficence. He too would have been happier to serve than to command. But it is not given to the lovers of the Lady Poverty to choose their special rank in her household. Don Gervaso's words came back to him with deepening significance and he thought how truly the old chaplain's prayer had been fulfilled. Honor and power had come to him, and they had abased him to the dust. The humilitas of his fathers, woven, carved, and painted on every side, pursued him with an ironical reminder of his impotence. Fulvia had not been mistaken in attributing his depression of spirit to de Crucis's visit. It was the first time that de Crucis had returned to Pianola since the new duke's accession. Odo had welcomed him eagerly and had again pressed him to remain, but de Crucis was on his way to Germany, bound on some business which could not be deferred. Odo, aware of the renewed activity of the Jesuits, supposed that this business was connected with the flight of the French refugees, many of whom were gone to Koblensk. But on this point the abbot was silent. Of the state of affairs in France he spoke openly and despondently. The immoderate haste with which the reforms had been granted filled him with fears for the future. Odo knew that Crescenti shared these fears, and the judgment of these two men, with whom he differed on fundamental principles, weighed with him far more than the opinions of the party he was supposed to represent. But he was in the case of many greater sovereigns of his day. He had set free the waters of reform, and the frail bark of his authority had been torn from its moorings and swept headlong into the central current. The next morning, to his surprise, the Duchess sent one of her gentlemen to ask an audience. Odo at once replied that he would wait on Her Highness, and a few moments later he was ushered into his wife's closet. She had just left her toilet, and was still in the morning negligee worn during that prolonged and public ceremonial. Freshly perfumed and powdered, her eyes bright, her lips set in a nervous smile, she curiously recalled the arrogant child who had snatched her spaniel away from him years ago in that same room. And was she not that child, after all? Had she ever grown beyond the imperious instincts of her youth? It seemed to him now that he had judged her harshly in the first months of their marriage. He had felt a momentary impatience when he had tried to force her roving impulses into the line of his own endeavor. It was easier to view her leniently now that she had almost passed out of his life. He wondered why she had sent for him. Some dispute with her household, doubtless, a quarrel with a servant, even, or perhaps some sordid difficulty with her creditors. But she began in a new key. "'Your Highness,' she said, is not given to taking my advice. Odo looked at her in surprise, 
the opportunity is not often accorded me, he replied with a smile. Maria Clementina made an impatient gesture. Then her face softened. Contradictory emotions flitted over it like the reflections cast by a hurrying sky. She came close to him and then drew away and seated herself in the high-backed chair where she had throned when he first saw her. Suddenly she blushed and began to speak. Once, she said in a low, almost inaudible voice, I was able to give your highness warning of an impending danger. She paused, and her eyes rested full on Odo. He felt his color rise as he returned her gaze. It was her first allusion to the past. He had supposed she had forgotten. For a moment he remained awkwardly silent. Do you remember? she asked. I remember. The danger was a grave one. Your Highness may recall that, but for my warning you would not have been advised of it. I remember, he said again. She paused a moment. The danger, she repeated, was a grave one, but it threatened only your Highness's person. Your Highness listened to me then. Will you listen again if I advise you of a greater, a, a peril threatening not only your person, but your throne? Odo smiled. He could guess now what was coming. She had been drilled to act as the mouthpiece of the opposition. He composed his features and said quietly, These are grave words, madam. I know of no such peril, but I am always ready to listen to your highness. His smile had betrayed him, and a quick flame of anger passed over her face. Why should you listen to me, since you never heed what I say? Your highness has just reminded me that I did so once. Once, she repeated bitterly. You were younger then, and so was I. She glanced at herself in the mirror with a dissatisfied laugh. Something in her look and movement touched the springs of compassion. "'Try me again,' he said gently. "'If I am older, perhaps I am also wiser, and therefore even more willing to be guided.' "'Oh!' she caught him up with a sneer. "'You are willing enough to be guided. We all know that.' She broke off as though she felt her mistake and wished to make a fresh beginning. Again her face was full of fluctuating meaning, and he saw beneath its shallow surface the eddy of incoherent impulses. When she spoke, it was with a noble gravity. "'Your Highness,' she said, "'does not take me into his counsels, but it is no secret at court and in the town that you have in contemplation a grave political measure.' "'I have made no secret of it,' he replied. "'No, or I should be the last to know it,' she exclaimed with one of her sudden lapses into petulance. Odo made no reply. Her futility was beginning to weary him. She saw it, and again attempted an impersonal dignity of manner. "'It has been your highness's choice,' she said, "'to exclude me from public affairs. Perhaps I was not fitted by education or intelligence to share in the cares of government. Your highness will at least bear witness that I have scrupulously respected your decision and have never attempted to intrude upon your counsels. Odo bowed. It would have been useless to remind her that he had sought her help and failed to obtain it. I have accepted my position, she continued. I have led the life to which it has pleased your highness to restrict me, but I have not been able to detach my heart as well as my thoughts from your highness's interests. I have not learned to be indifferent to your danger. Odo looked up quickly. She ceased to interest him when she spoke by the book, and he was impatient to make an end. You spoke of danger before, he said. What danger? That of forcing on your subjects liberties which they do not desire. Ah, said he thoughtfully. That was all, then. What a poor tool she made. He marveled that in all these years Trescori's skilful hands should not have fashioned her to better purpose. Your Highness, he said, has reminded me that since our marriage you have lived withdrawn from public affairs. 
I will not pause to dispute by whose choice this has been. I will in turn merely remind your highness that such a life does not afford much opportunity of gauging public opinion. In spite of himself, a note of sarcasm had again crept into his voice, but to his surprise she did not seem to resent it. Ah, she exclaimed, with more feeling than she had hitherto shown, you fancy that because I am kept in ignorance of what you think, I am ignorant also of what others think of you. Believe me, she said with a flash of insight that startled him, I know more of you than if we stood closer. But you mistake my purpose. I have not sent for you to force my counsels on you. I have no desire to appear ridiculous. I do not ask you to hear what I think of your course, but what others think of it. What others? The question did not disconcert her. Your subjects, she said quickly. My subjects are of many classes. All are of one class in resenting this charter. I am told you intend to proclaim it within a few days. I entreat you at least to delay, to reconsider your course. Oh, believe me when I say you are in danger. Of what use to offer a crown to Our Lady when you have it in your heart to slight her servants? But I will not speak of the clergy since you despise them, nor of the nobles since you ignore their claims. I will speak only of the people, the people in whose interest you profess to act. Believe me, in striking at the church you wound the poor. It is not their bodily welfare I mean, though heaven knows how many sources of bounty must now run dry. It is their faith you insult. First you turn them against their masters, then against their God. They may proclaim you for it now, but I tell you they will hate you for it in the end. She paused, flushed with the vehemence of her argument, and eager to press it further. But her last words had touched an unexpected fibre in Odo. He looked at her with his unseeing visionary gaze. The end, he murmured, who knows what the end will be? Do you still need to be told? she exclaimed. Must you always come to me to learn that you are in danger? If the state is in danger, the danger must be faced. The state exists for the people. If they do not need it, it has ceased to serve its purpose. She clasped her hands in an ecstasy of wonder. Oh, fool, madman, but it is not of the state I speak. It is you who are in danger, you, you, you. He raised his head with an impatient gesture. I, he said, I had thought you meant a graver peril. She looked at him in silence. Her pride met his and thrilled with it, and for a moment the two were one. Odo, oh, she cried. She sank into a chair, and he went to her and took her hand. Such fears are worthy of neither of us, he said gravely. I am not ashamed of them, she said. Her hand clung to him, and she lifted her eyes to his face. You will listen to me, she whispered in a glow. He drew back, chilled. If only she had kept the feminine in abeyance, but sex was her only weapon. I have listened, he said quietly, and I thank you. But you will not be counseled? In the last issue, one must be one's own counselor. Her face flamed. If you were but that, she tossed back at him. The taunt struck him full. He knew that he should have let it lie, but he caught it up in spite of himself. Madam, he said. I should have appealed to our sovereign, not to her servant, she cried, dashing into the breach she had made. He stood motionless, stunned almost. For what she had said was true, he was no longer the sovereign. The rule had passed out of his hands. His silence frightened her. With an instinctive jealousy, she saw that her words had started a train of thought in which she had no part. She felt herself ignored, abandoned and all her passions rushed to the defense of her wounded vanity. Oh, believe me, she cried, I speak as your duchess, not as your wife. That is a name in which I should never dream of appealing to you. I have ever stood apart from your private pleasures, as became a woman of my house. She faced him with a flash of the Austrian insolence. 
but when i see the state drifting to ruin as the result of your caprice when i see your own life endangered your people turned against you religion openly insulted law and authority made the plaything of this this false atheistical creature that has robbed me robbed me of all she broke down helplessly and hid her face with a sob odo stood speechless spellbound he could not mistake what had happened the woman had surged to the surface at last the real woman passionate self-centered undisciplined but so piteous after all in this sudden subjection to the one tenderness that survived in her she loved him and was jealous of her rival that was the instinct which had swept all others aside at that moment she cared nothing for her safety or his the state might perish if they but fell together it was the distance between them that maddened her the tragic simplicity of the revelation left odo silent for a fantastic moment he yielded to the vision of what that waste power might have accomplished life seemed to him a confusion of roving force that met only to crash in ruins his silence drew her to her feet she repossessed herself throbbing but valiant my fears for your highness's safety have led my speech astray i have given your highness the warning it was my duty to give beyond that i had no thought of trespassing and still odo was silent a dozen answers struggled to his lips but they were checked by the stealing sense of duality that so often paralyzed his action he had recovered his lucidity of vision and his impulses faded before it like mist he saw life again as it was an incomplete and shabby business a patchwork of torn and raveled effort everywhere the shears of atropus were busy and never could the cut threads be joined again he took his wife's hand and bent over it ceremoniously it lay in his like a stone End of Book Four, Part Seven. The Valley of Decision by Edith Wharton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Four, Part Eight. The Jubilee of the Mountain Madonna fell on the Feast of the Purification. It was mid November, but with a sky of June. The autumn rains had ceased for the moment, and fields and orchards glistened with a late verdure. Never had the faithful gathered in such numbers to do honor to the wonder-working virgin. A widespread resistance to the influences of free thought and Jansenism was pouring fresh life into the old formulas of devotion. Though many motives combined to strengthen this movement, it was still mainly a simple expression of loyalty to old ideals an instinctive rallying around a threatened cause it is the honest conviction underlying all great popular impulses that gives them their real strength and in this case the thousands of pilgrims flocking on foot to the mountain shrine embodied a greater moral force than the powerful ecclesiastics at whose call they had gathered the clergy themselves were come from all sides while those that were unable to attend had sent costly gifts to the miraculous virgin the bishops of Mantua, Modena, Vercelli, and Cremona had travelled to Pianora in state, the people flocking out beyond the gates to welcome them. Four mitred abbots, several monsignori, and priors, rectors, vicars general, and canons innumerable rode in the procession, followed on foot by the humble army of parish priests and by interminable confraternities of all orders. The approach of the great dignitaries was hailed with enthusiasm by the crowds lining the roads. Even the Bishop of Pianora, never popular with the people, received an unwanted measure of applause, and the white-cowled prior of the Dominicans, riding by stern and close-lipped as a monk of Zerberon's, was greeted with frenzied acclamations. The report that the bishop and the heads of the religious houses in Pianora were to set free dinners for the pilgrims had doubtless quickened this outburst of piety yet it was perhaps chiefly due to the sense of coming peril that had gradually permeated the dim consciousness of the crowd in the church the glow of lights the thrilling beauty of the music and the glitter of the priestly vestments were blent in a melting harmony of sound and colour 
the shrine of the madonna shone with unearthly radiance hundreds of candles formed an elongated nimbus around her heretic figure which was surmounted by the canopy of cloth of gold presented by the duke of modena the bishops of vercelli and cremona had offered a robe of silver brocade studded with coral and turquoises the devout princess clotilla of savoy an emerald necklace the bishop of pianora a marvellous veil of rose point made in a flemish convent while on the statue's brow rested the duke's jewelled diadem the duke himself seated in his tribune above the choir observed the scene with a renewed appreciation of the church's unfailing dramatic instinct at first he saw in the spectacle only this outer and symbolic side of which the mere sensuous beauty had always deeply moved him but as he watched the effect produced on the great throng filling the aisles he began to see that this external splendor was but the veil before the sanctuary and to realize what de Cruces meant when he spoke of the deep hold of the church upon the people every color every gesture every word and note of music that made up the texture of the gorgeous ceremonial might indeed seem part of a long-studied and astutely planned effect yet each had its root in some instinct of the heart some natural development of the inner life so that they were in fact not the cunningly adjusted fragments of an arbitrary pattern but the inseparable fibres of a living organism it was odo's misfortune to see too far ahead on the road along which his destiny was urging him as he sat there face to face with the people he was trying to lead he heard above the music of the mass and the chant of the kneeling throng an echo of the question that don gervaso had once put to him if you take christ from the people what have you to give them instead he was roused by a burst of silver clarions the mass was over and the duke and duchess were to descend from their tribune and venerate the holy image before it was carried through the church odo rose and gave his hand to his wife they had not seen each other save in public since their last conversation in her closet the duchess walked with set lips and head erect keeping her profile turned to him as they descended the steps and advanced to the choir none knew better how to take her part in such a pageant she had the gift of drawing upon herself the undivided attention of any assemblage in which she moved and the consciousness of this power lent a kind of olympian buoyancy to her gait the richness of her dress and her extravagant display of jewels seemed almost a challenge to the sacred image blazing like a rainbow beneath its golden canopy and odo smiled to think that his childish fancy had once compared the brilliant being at his side to the humble tinsel-decked virgin of the church at pontesordo as the couple advanced stillness fell on the church the air was full of the lingering haze of incense through which the sunlight from the clerestory poured in prismatic splendors on the statue of the virgin rigid superhuman a molten flamboyancy of gold and gems the wonder-working madonna shone out above her worshippers the duke and duchess paused bowing deeply below the choir then they mounted the steps and knelt before the shrine as they did so a crash broke the silence and the startled devotees saw that the ducal diadem had fallen from the madonna's head the hush prolonged itself a moment then a cannon sprang forward to pick up the crown and with the movement a murmur rose and spread through the church the duke's offering had fallen to the ground as he approached to venerate the blessed image that this was an omen no man could doubt it needed no augur to interpret it the murmur gathering force as it swept through the packed aisles passed from surprise to fear from fear to a deep hum of anger for the people understood as plainly as though she had spoken that the virgin of the valsecas had cast from her the gift of an unbeliever the ceremonies over the long procession was formed again and set out toward the city the crowd had surged ahead and when the duke rode through the gates the streets were already thronged moving slowly between the compact mass of people he felt himself as closely observed as on the day of his state entry but with far different effect enthusiasm had given way to a cold curiosity the excitement of the spectators had spent itself in the morning and the sight of their sovereign failed to rouse their flagging ardor 
Now and then a cheer broke out, but it died again without kindling another in the uninflammable mass. Odo could not tell how much of this indifference was due to a natural reaction from the emotions of the morning, how much to his personal unpopularity, how much to the ominous impression produced by the falling of the virgin's crown. He rode between his people, oppressed by a sense of estrangement such as he had never known. He felt himself shut off from them by an impassable barrier of superstition and ignorance, and every effort to reach them was like the wrong turn in a labyrinth drawing him further away from the issue to which it seemed to lead. As he advanced under this indifferent or hostile scrutiny, he thought how much easier it would be to face a rain of bullets than this withering glare of criticism. A sudden longing to escape, to be done with it all, came over him with sickening force. His nerves ached with the physical strain of holding himself upright on his horse, of preserving the statuesque erectness proper to the occasion. He felt like one of his own ancestral effigies, of which the wooden framework had rotted under the splendid robes. A congestion at the head of a narrow street had checked the procession, and he was obliged to rein in his horse. He looked about and found himself in the center of the square near the baptistry. A few feet off, directly in a line with him, was the weather-worn front of the royal printing press. He raised his head and saw a group of people on the balcony. Though they were close at hand, he saw them in a blur, against which Fulvia's figure suddenly detached itself. She had told him that she was to view the procession with the Andriones, but through the mental haze which enveloped him her apparition struck a vague surprise. He looked at her intently, and their eyes met. A faint happiness stole over her face, but no recognition was possible, and she continued to gaze out steadily upon the throng below the balcony. Involuntarily his glance followed hers, and he saw that she was herself the center of the crowd's attention. Her plain, almost Quakerish habit, and the tranquil dignity of her carriage, made her a conspicuous figure among the animated groups in the adjoining windows, and Odo, with the acuteness of perception which a public life develops, was instantly aware that her name was on every lip. At the same moment he saw a woman close to his horse's feet snatch up her child and make the sign against the evil eye. A boy who stood staring open-mouthed at Fulvia caught the gesture and repeated it. A barefoot friar imitated the boy, and it seemed to Odo that the familiar sign was spreading with malignant rapidity to the farthest limits of the crowd. The impression was only momentary, for the cavalcade was again in motion, and without raising his eyes he rode on, sick at heart. At nightfall a man opened the gate of the ducal gardens below the Chinese pavilion and stepped out into the deserted lane. He locked the gate and slipped the key into his pocket. Then he turned and walked toward the center of the town. As he reached the more populous quarters his walk slackened to a stroll, and now and then he paused to observe a knot of merrymakers, or look through the curtains of the tents set up in the squares. The man was plainly but decently dressed, like a petty tradesman or a lawyer's clerk, and the night being chill he wore a cloak, and had drawn his hat-brim over his forehead. He sauntered on, letting the crowd carry him, with the air of one who has an hour to kill and whose holiday-making takes the form of an amused spectatorship. To such an observer the streets offered ample entertainment. The shrewd air discouraged lounging and kept the crowd in motion, but the open platforms built for dancing were thronged with couples, and every peep-show, wine-shop, and astrologer's booth was packed to the doors. The shrines and street lamps were all alight, and booths and platforms hung with countless lanterns. The scene was as bright as day but in the ever-shifting medley of peasant dresses, liveries, monkish cowls, and carnival disguises, a soberly clad man might easily go unremarked. Reaching the square before the cathedral, the solitary observer pushed his way through the idlers gathered about a dais with a curtain at the back. Before the curtain stood a Milanese quack, dressed like a noble gentleman with sword and plumed hat, and rehearsing his cures in stentorian tones, while his zany, in the short mask and green and white habit of Brigella, cracked jokes and turned handsprings for the diversion of the vulgar. Behold, the charlatan was shouting, the marvellous Egyptian love filter distilled from the pearl that the great Emperor Antony dropped into Queen Cleopatra's cup 
this infallible fluid handed down for generations in the family of my ancestor the high priest of isis the bray of a neighbouring showman's trumpet cut him short and yielding to circumstances he drew back the curtain and a tumbling girl sprang out and began her antics on the front of the stage what did he say was the price of that drink janini asked a young maid-servant pulling her neighbour's sleeve are you thinking of buying it for petrino my beauty <laughs> the other returned with a laugh believe me it is a sound proverb that says when the fruit is ripe it falls of itself the girl drew away angrily and the quack took up his harangue the same filter ladies and gentlemen though in confessing it i betray a professional secret the same filter i declare to you on the honour of a nobleman whereby in your own city a lady no longer young and in no way remarkable in looks or station has captured and subjugated the affections of one so high so exalted so above all others in beauty rank wealth power and dignities oh, oh that's that's the duke sniggered a voice in the crowd ladies and gentlemen i name no names cried the quack impressively no need to retorted the voice they do say though she gave him something to drink said a young woman to a youth in a clerk's dress the saying is she studied medicine with the turks the moors you mean said the clerk with an air of superiority well they say her mother was a turkey slave and her father a murderer from the sultan's galleys no no she's plain piedmontese i tell you her father was a physician in turin and was driven out of the country for poisoning his patients in order to watch their death agonies they say she's good to the poor though said another voice doubtfully good to the poor ay and that's what they said of her father all i know is that she heard stefano the weaver's lad had the falling sickness she carried him a potion with her own hands the next day the child was dead and a carmelite friar who saw the vial he drank from said it was the same shape and size as one that was found in a witch's grave when they were digging the foundations for the new monastery ladies and gentlemen shrieked the quack what am i offered for a drop of this priceless liquor the listener turned aside and pushed his way toward the farther end of the square as he did so, he ran against a merry Andrew who thrust a long printed sheet in his hand. Buy my satirical ballads, ladies and gentlemen, the fellow shouted. Two for a farthing, invented and written by my own cousin of the great Pasquino of Rome. What will you have, sir? Here's the secret history of the famous prince's amours with an atheist. Here's the true scandal of an illustrious lady's necklace. Two for a farthing. And, and, and my humblest thanks to your excellency he pocketed the coin and the other thrusting the broadsheets beneath his cloak pushed on to the nearest coffee-house here every table was thronged and the babble of talk so loud that the stranger hopeless of obtaining refreshment pressed his way into the remotest corner of the room and seated himself on an empty cask at first he sat motionless silently observing the crowd then he drew forth the ballads and ran his eye over them he was still engaged in this study when his notice was attracted by a loud discussion going forward between a party of men at the nearest table. The disputants, petty tradesmen or artisans by their dress, had evidently been warmed by a good flagon of wine, and their tones were so lively that every word reached the listener on the cask. "'Reform! Reform!' cried one, who appeared by his dress and manner to be the weightiest of the company it's all very well to cry reform but what i say is that most of those that are howling for it no more know what they're asking than a parrot that's been taught the litany now the first question is who benefits by your reform and what's the answer to that huh is it the tradesmen the merchants the clerks artisans household servants i ask you i hear some of my fellow tradesmen complaining that the nobility don't pay their bills will they be better paid thank you when the duke has halved their revenues will the quality keep up as large households employ as many lackeys set as lavish tables wear as fine clothes collect as many rarities buy as many horses give us in short as many opportunities of making our profit out of their pleasure what i say is if we're to have new taxes don't let them fall on the very class we live by well that's true enough said another speaker a lean bilious man with a pen behind his ear a peasantry the only class that are going to profit by this constitution and what do the peasantry do for us i should like to know the first speaker went on triumphantly as far as the fat friars go i'm not sorry to see them squeezed a trifle 
for they've wrung enough money out of our women folk to lie between feathers from now till doomsday. But I say, if you care for your pockets, don't lay hands on the nobility. Gently, gently, my friend, exclaimed a cautious, flaccid-looking man, sitting down his glass. Father and son, for four generations, my family have served Pianotto with church candles. And I can tell you that since these new atheistical notions came in, the nobility are not the good patrons they used to be. But as for the friars, I should be sorry to see them meddled with. It's true they may get the best morsels in the pot and the warmest seat on the hearth, and one of them now and then may take too long to teach a pretty girl her paternoster, but I'm not sure we shall be better off when they're gone. Formerly, if a child too many came to poor folks, they could always comfort themselves of the thought that if there was no room for them at home, the church was there to provide for them. But if we drive out the good friars, a man'll have to count mouths before he dares look at his wife too lovingly. Well, said the scribe with a dry smile, I have a notion the good friars have always taken more than they gave, and if it were not for the gaping mouths under the cowl, even a good man might have victuals enough for his own. The first speaker turned on him contentiously. Do I understand you are for this new charter, then? he asked. No, no, said the other. Better hot polenta than cold ortolan. Things are none too good as they are, but I never care to taste first of a new dish, and in this case I don't fancy the cook. Ah, oh, that's it, said the soft man. It's too much like the apothecary's wife mixing his drugs for him. Men of Roman lineage want no women to govern them. He puffed himself out and thrust a hand in his bosom. Besides, gentlemen, he added, dropping his voice and glancing cautiously about the room, the saints are my witness I'm not superstitious, but frankly now I don't much fancy this business of the virgin's crown. What do ye mean? asked a lean, visionary-looking youth who had been drinking and listening. Why, sir, I needn't say I'm the last man in Pianora to listen to a woman's tattle, but my wife had it straight from Sino the barber, whose sister is Portus of the Benedictines, that two days since one of the nuns foretold the whole business, precisely as it happened. And what's more, many that were in the church this morning will tell you that they distinctly saw the blessed image raise both arms and tear the crown from her head <laughs> said the young man flippantly what became of the bambino meanwhile i wonder the scribe shrugged his shoulders we all know said he that Cino the barber lies like a christened jew but i'm not surprised the thing was known in advance for i make no doubt the priest pulled the wire that brought down the crown the fat man looked scandalized, and the first speaker waved the subject aside as unworthy of attention. Such tales are for women and monks, he said impatiently, but the business has its serious side. I tell you, we are being hurried to our ruin. Here's this matter of draining the marshes of Pontesordo. Who's to pay for that? The class that profits by it? Not by a long sight. It's we who drain the land, and the peasants are to live on it. The visionary youth tossed back his hair. But isn't that an inspiration to you, sir? he exclaimed. Does not your heart dilate at the thought of uplifting the condition of your downtrodden fellows? My fellows? The <laughs> peasantry, my fellows? cried the other. I'd have you know, my young master, that I come of a long and honorable line of cloth merchants that have had their names on the guild for two hundred years and over. I have nothing to do with the peasantry, thank God. The youth had emptied another glass. What? he screamed. You deny the universal kinship of man? You disown your starving brothers? Proud tyrant, remember the Bastille. He burst into tears and began to quote Alfieri. Well, said the fat man, turning a disgusted shoulder on this display of emotion, to my mind this business of draining Ponasordo is too much like telling the Almighty what to do. If God made the land wet, what right have we to dry it? Those that begin by meddling with the Creator's works may end up laying hands on the Creator. You're right, said another. There's no knowing where these newfangled notions may land us. 
For my part, I was rather taken by them at first, but since I find that his highness, to pay for all his good works, is cutting down his household and throwing decent people out of a job, like my own son, for instance, that was one of the under steward's boys at the palace, why, since then, I begin to see a little further into the game. A shabby, shrewd-looking fellow in a dirty coat and snuff-stained stock had sauntered up to the table and stood listening with an amused smile. Ah, said the scribe, glancing up, there's a thoroughgoing reformer who'll be asking us all to throw up our hats for the new charter. The newcomer laughed contemptuously. Ha, <laughs> I, he said, God forbid. The new charter's none of my making. It's only another dodge for getting round the populace, for appearing to give them what they would rise up and take if it were denied them any longer. "'Why, I thought you were hot for these reforms,' exclaimed the fat man with surprise. The other shrugged. "'You might as well say I was in favor of having the sun rise tomorrow. It would probably rise at the same hour if I voted against it. Reform is bound to come whether your dukes and princes are for it or against it. And those that grant constitutions instead of refusing them are like men who tie a string to their hats before going out in a gale.' The string may hold for a while, but if it blows hard enough, the hats will all come off in the end. Aye, aye, and meanwhile we furnish the string from our own pockets, said the scribe with a chuckle. The shabby man grinned. It won't be the last thing to come out of your pockets, said he, turning to push his way toward another table. The others rose and called for their reckoning and the listener on the cask slipped out of his corner, elbowed a passage to the door, and stepped forth into the square. It was after midnight, a thin drizzle was falling, and the crowd had scattered. The rain was beginning to extinguish the paper lanterns and the torches, and the canvas sides of the tents flapped dismally like wet sheets on a clothesline. The man drew his cloak closer, and avoiding the stragglers who crossed his path, turned into the first street that led to the palace. He walked fast over the slippery cobblestones, buffeted by a rising wind and threading his way between dark walls and sleeping house fronts till he reached the lane below the ducal gardens. He unlocked the door by which he had come forth, entered the gardens, and paused a moment on the terrace above the lane. Behind him rose the palace, a dark, irregular bulk, with a lighted window showing here and there. Below him lay the city, an undistinguishable huddle of roofs and towers under the rainy night. He stood a while gazing out over it. Then he turned and walked toward the palace. The garden alleys were deserted, the pleached walks dark as subterranean passages, with the wet gleam of statues starting spectrally out of the blackness. The man walked rapidly, leaving the Boromini wing on his left, and skirting the outstanding mass of the older buildings. Behind the marble buttresses of the chapel he crossed the dense obscurity of a court between high walls, found a door under an archway, turned a key in the lock, and gained a spiral stairway as dark as the court. He groped his way up the stairs and paused a moment on the landing to listen. Then he opened another door, lifted a heavy hanging of tapestry, and stepped into the duke's closet. It stood empty, with a lamp burning low on the desk. The man threw off his cloak and hat, dropped into a chair beside the desk, and hid his face in his hands. End of Book Four, Part Eight The Valley of Decision by Edith Wharton This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Four, Part Nine it was the eve of the duke's birthday. A cabinet council had been called in the morning, and his highness's ministers had submitted to him the revised draft of the constitution which was to be proclaimed on the morrow. Throughout the conference, which was brief and formal, Odo had been conscious of a subtle change in the ministerial atmosphere. Instead of the current of resistance against which he had grown used to forcing his way, he became aware of a tacit yielding to his will. Trescori had apparently withdrawn his opposition to the charter, and the other ministers had followed suit. To Odo's overwrought imagination there was something ominous in the change. 
he had counted on the goad of opposition to fight off the fatal languor which he had learned to expect at such crises now that he found there was to be no struggle he understood how largely his zeal had of late depended on such facetious incentives he felt an irrational longing to throw himself on the other side of the conflict to tear in bits the paper awaiting his signature and disown the policy which had dictated it but the tide of acquiescence on which he was afloat was no stagnant backwater of indifference but the glassy reach just above the fall of a river the current was as swift as it was smooth and he felt himself hurried forward to an end he could no longer escape he took the pen which trescorri handed him and signed the constitution the meeting over he summoned gamba he felt the need of such encouragement as the hunchback alone could give fulvia's enthusiasms were too unreal too abstract she lived in a region of ideals whence ugly facts were swept out by some process of mental housewifery which kept her world perpetually smiling and immaculate gamba at least fed his convictions on facts if his outlook was narrow it was direct no roseate medium of fancy was interposed between his vision and the truth he stood listening thoughtfully while odo poured forth his doubts your highness may well hesitate he said at last there are always more good reasons against a new state of things than for it i am not surprised that count trescorri appears to have withdrawn his opposition i believe he now honestly wishes your highness to proclaim the constitution odo looked up in surprise you do not mean that he has come to believe in it gamba smiled probably not in your highness's sense but he may have found a use of his own for it what do you mean odo asked if he does not believe it will benefit the state he may think it will injure your highness ah said the duke slowly there was a pause during which he was possessed by the same shuddering reluctance to fix his mind on the facts before him as when he had questioned the hunchback about momola's death he longed to cast the whole business aside to be up and away from it drawing breath in a new world where every air was not tainted with corruption he raised his head with an effort you think then that the liberals are secretly acting against me in this matter i am persuaded of it your highness odo hesitated you have always told me he began again that the love of dominion was your brother's ruling passion if he really believes this movement will be popular with the people why should he secretly oppose it instead of making the most of his own share in it as the minister of a popular sovereign for several reasons gamba answered promptly in the first place the reforms your highness has introduced are not of his own choosing and trescorri has little sympathy with any policy he has not dictated in the second place the powers and opportunities of a constitutional minister are too restricted to satisfy his appetite for rule and thirdly he paused a moment as though doubtful how his words would be received i suspect trescorri of having a private score against your highness which he would be glad to pay off publicly odo fell silent yielding himself to a fresh current of thought i know not what score he may have against me he said at length but what injures me must injure the state and if trescorri has any such motive for withdrawing his opposition it must be because he believes the constitution will defeat its own ends he does believe that assuredly but he is not the only one of your highness's ministers that would ruin the state on the chance of finding an opportunity among the ruins that is as may be said odo with a touch of weariness i have seen enough of human ambition to learn how limited and unimaginative a passion it is if it saw further i would fear it more but it is short-sighted it sees clearly at close range and the motive you ascribe to trescorri would imply that he believes the constitution will be a failure without doubt your highness i am convinced that your ministers have done all they could to prevent the proclamation of the charter and failing that to thwart its workings if it be proclaimed in this they have gone hand in hand with the clergy and their measures have been well taken 
but i do not believe that any state of mind produced by external influences can long withstand the natural drift of opinion and your highness may be sure that though the talkers and writers are mostly against you in this matter the mass of the people are with you odo answered with a despairing gesture how can i be sure when the people have no means of expressing their needs it is like trying to guess the wants of a deaf and dumb man the hunchback flushed suddenly the people will not always be deaf and dumb he said some day they will speak not in my day said odo wearily and meanwhile we blunder on without ever really knowing what incalculable instincts and prejudices are pitted against us you and your party tell me the people are sick of the burdens the clergy lay on them yet their blind devotion to the church is manifest at every turn and it did not need the business of the virgin's crown to show me how little reason and justice can avail against such influences gamba replied by an impatient gesture as to the virgin's crown he said your highness must have guessed it was one of the friar's tricks a last expedient to turn the people against you i was not bred up by a priest for nothing i know what past masters those gentry are in raising ghosts and reading portents they know the minds of the poor folk as the herdsman knows the habits of his cattle and for generations they have used that knowledge to bring the people more completely under their control and what have we to oppose to such a power odo exclaimed we are fighting the battle of ideas against passions of reflection against instinct and you have but to look in the human heart to guess which side will win in such a struggle we have science and truth and common sense with us you say yes but the church has love and fear and tradition and the solidarity of nigh two thousand years of dominion gamba listened in respectful silence then he replied with a faint smile all that your highness says is true but i beg leave to relate to your highness a tale which i read lately in an old book of your library according to this story it appears that when the early christians of alexandria set out to destroy the pagan idols in the temples they were seized with great dread at sight of the god serapis for even those that did not believe in the old gods feared them and none dared raise a hand against the sacred image but suddenly a soldier who was bolder than the rest flung his battle-axe at the figure and when it broke in pieces there rushed out nothing worse than a great company of rats the duke had promised to visit fulvia that evening for several days his state of indecision had made him find pretexts for avoiding her but now that the charter was signed and he had ordered its proclamation he craved the contact of her unwavering faith he found her alone in the dusk of the convent parlor but he had hardly crossed the threshold before he was aware of an indefinable change in his surroundings she advanced with an impulsiveness out of harmony with the usual tranquillity of their meetings and he felt her hand tremble and burn in his in the twilight it seemed to him that her very dress had a warmer rustle and glimmer that there emanated from her glance and movements some heady fragrance of a long past summer he smiled to think that this phantom coquetry should have risen at the summons of an academic degree but some deeper sense in him was stirred as by a vision of waste riches adrift on the dim seas of chance for a moment she sat silent as in the days when they had been too near each other for many words and there was something indescribably soothing in this dreamlike return to the past it was he who roused himself first how young you look he said giving involuntary utterance to his thought do i she answered gaily i am glad of that for i feel extraordinarily young to-night perhaps it is because i have been thinking a great deal of the old days of venice and turin and of the high road to vercelli for instance she glanced at him with a smile do you know she went on moving to a seat at his side and laying a hand on the arm of his chair that there is one secret of mine you have never guessed in all these years odo returned her smile what is it i wonder he said she fixed him with bright bantering eyes i knew why you deserted us at vercelli he uttered an exclamation but she lifted a hand to his lips ah how angry i was then but why be angry now 
it all happened so long ago, and if it had not happened, who knows, perhaps you would never have pitied me enough to love me as you did. She laughed softly, reminiscently, leaning back as if to let the tide of memories ripple over her. Then she raised her head suddenly and said in a changed voice, Ah, your plan's fixed for tomorrow? Odo glanced at her in surprise. Her mind seemed to move as capriciously as Maria Clementina's. The Constitution is signed, he answered, and my ministers proclaim it tomorrow morning. He looked at her a moment and lifted her hand to his lips. Everything has been done according to your wishes, he said. She drew away with a start, and he saw that she had turned pale. No, no, not as I wish, she murmured. It must not be because I wish... She broke off, and her hand slipped from his. You have taught me to wish as you wish, he answered gently. Surely you would not disown your pupil now. Her agitation increased. Do not call yourself that, she exclaimed. Not even in jest. What you have done has been done of your own choice, because you thought it best for your people. My nearness or absence could have made no difference. He looked at her with growing wonder. Why this sudden modesty? he said with a smile. I thought you prided yourself on your share of the great work. She tried to force an answering smile, but the curve broke into a quiver of distress, and she came close to him with a gesture that seemed to take flight from herself. Don't say it! Don't say it! she broke out. What right have you to call it my doing? I but stood aside and watched you and gloried in you. Is there any guilt to a woman in that? She clung to him for a moment, hiding her face in his breast. He loosened her arms gently that he might draw back and look at her. Fulvia, he asked, what ails you? You are not yourself tonight. Has anything happened to distress you? Have you been annoyed or alarmed in any way? It is not possible, he broke off, that Frescori has been here. She drew away, flushed and protesting. No, no, she exclaimed. Why should Frescori come here? Why should you fancy that anyone has been here? I am excited, I know, I talk idly, but it is because I have been thinking too long of these things. Of what things? Of what people say. How can one help hearing that? I sometimes fancy that the more withdrawn one lives, the more distinctly one hears the outer noises. But why should you heed the outer noises? You have never done so before. Because I was wrong not to do so before. Perhaps I should have listened sooner. Perhaps others have seen, understood, sooner than I. Oh, the thought is intolerable. She moved a pace or two away, and then, regaining the mastery of her lips and eyes, turned to him with a show of calmness. Your heart was never in this charter, she began. Fulvia, he cried protestingly, but she lifted a silencing hand. Ah, I have seen it, I have felt it, but I was never willing to own that you were right. My pride in you blinded me, I suppose. I could not bear to dream any fate for you but the greatest. I saw you always leading events rather than waiting on them. But true greatness lies in the man, not in his actions. Compromise, delay, renunciation, these may be as heroic as conflict. A woman's vision is so narrow that I did not see this at first. You have always told me that I looked only at one side of the question. But I see the other side now. I see that you were right. Odo stood silent. He had followed her with growing wonder. A volt face so little in keeping with her mental habits immediately struck him as a faint. Yet so strangely did it accord with his own secret reluctances that these inclined him to let it pass unnoticed. Some instinctive loyalty to his past checked the temptation. I am not sure that I understand you, he said slowly. Have you lost faith in the ideas we have worked for? She hesitated, and he saw the struggle beneath her surface calmness. No, no, she exclaimed quickly. I have not lost faith in them. In me, then? She smiled with disarming sadness. That would be so much simpler, she murmured. What do you mean, then, he urged. We must understand each other. He paused and measured his words out slowly. Do you think it a mistake to proclaim the Constitution tomorrow? Again her face was full of shadowy contradictions. I entreat you not to proclaim it tomorrow, 
she said in a low voice. Odo felt the blood drum in his ears. Was not this the word for which he had waited? But still some deeper instinct held him back, warning him, as it seemed, that to fall below his purpose at such a juncture was the only measurable failure. He must know more before he yielded, see deeper into her heart and his, and each moment brought the clearer conviction that there was more to know and see. This is unlike you, Fulvia, he said. You cannot make such a request on impulse. You must have a reason. She smiled. You told me once that a woman's reasons are only impulses in men's clothes. But he was not to be diverted by this thrust. I shall think so now, he said unless you can give me some better account of yours. She was silent, and he pressed on with a persistency for which he himself could hardly account. You must have a reason for this request. I have one, she said, dropping her attempts at evasion. And it is? She paused again with a look of appeal against which he had to stiffen himself. I do not believe the time has come, she said at length. You think the people are not ready for the Constitution? She answered with an effort. I think the people are not ready for it. He fell silent, and they sat facing each other, but with eyes apart. You have received this impression from Gamba, from Andrioni, from the members of our party? he asked. She made no reply. Remember, Fulvia, he went on almost sternly, that this is the end for which we have worked together all these years, the end for which we renounced each other and went forth in our youth, you to exile and I to an unwilling sovereignty. It was because we loved this cause better than ourselves that we had strength to give up for it our personal hopes of happiness. If we betray the cause for any merely personal motive, we shall have fallen below our earlier selves. He waited again, but she was still silent. Can you swear to me, he went on, that no such motive influences you now, that you honestly believe we have been deceived and mistaken, that our years of faith and labor have been wasted, and that if mankind is to be helped, it is to be in other ways and by other efforts than ours? He stood before her accusingly almost, the passion of the long fight surging up in him as he felt the weapon drop from his hand. Fulvia had sat motionless under his appeal, but as he paused she rose with an impulsive gesture. Oh, why do you torment me with questions? she cried, half sobbing. I venture to counsel a delay, and you arraign me as though I stood at the day of judgment. It is our day of judgment, he retorted. It is the day on which life confronts us with our own actions, and we must justify them or own ourselves deluded. He went up to her and caught her hands entreatingly. Fulvia, he said, I too have doubted, wavered, and if you would give me one honest reason that is worthy of us both. She broke from him to hide her weeping. Reasons, reasons, she stammered. What does the heart know of reasons? I ask a favor, the first I ever ask of you, and you answer by haggling with me for reasons. Something in her voice and gesture was like a lightning flash over a dark landscape. In an instant he saw the pit at his feet. Someone has been with you. Those words were not yours, he cried. She rallied instantly. That is a pretext for not heeding them, she returned. The lightning glared again. He stepped close and faced her. The Duchess has been here, he said. She dropped into a chair and hid her face from him. A wave of anger mounted from his heart, choking back his words and filling his brain with its fumes. But as it subsided, he felt himself suddenly cool, firm, untempered. There could be no wavering, no self-questioning now. When did this happen, he asked. She shook her head despairingly. Fulvia, he said, if you will not speak, I will speak for you. I can guess what arguments were used, what threats even. Were there threats? Burst from him in a fresh leap of anger. She raised her head slowly. Threats would not have mattered, she said. But your fears were played on, your fears for my safety? Fulvia, answer me, he insisted. She rose suddenly and laid her arms about his shoulders with a gesture half tender, half maternal. 
Oh, she said, why will you torture me? I have borne much for our love's sake, and would have borne this too, in silence, like the rest. But to speak of it is to relive it, and my strength fails me. He held her hands fast, keeping his eyes on hers. No, he said, for your strength never failed you when there was any call on it, and our whole past calls on it now. Rouse yourself, Fulvia, look life in the face. You were told there might be troubles tomorrow, that I was in danger, perhaps? There was worse, there was worse, she shuddered. Worse? The blame was laid on me, the responsibility, your love for me, my power over you were accused. The people hate me, they hate you for loving me. Oh, I have destroyed you, she cried. Odo felt a slow, cold strength pouring into all his veins. It was as though his enemies, in thinking to mix a mortal poison, had rendered him invulnerable. He bent over her with great gentleness. Fulvia, this is madness, he said. A moment's thought must show you what passions are here at work. Can you not rise above such fears? No one can judge between us but ourselves. Ah, but you do not know, you will not understand. Your life may be in danger, she cried. I have been told that before, he said contemptuously. It is a common trick of the political game. This is no trick, she exclaimed. I was made to see, to understand, and I swear to you that the danger is real. And what if it were? Is the church to have all the martyrs? said he gaily. Come, Fulvia, shake off such fancies. My life is as safe as yours. At worst, there may be a little hissing to be faced. That is easy enough compared to facing one's own doubts. And I have no doubts now. That is all past, thank heaven. I see the road straight before me, as straight as when you showed it to me once before, years ago, in the inn parlor at Peschera. You pointed the way to it then. Surely you would not hold me back from it now. He took her in his arms and kissed her lips to silence. When we meet tomorrow, he said, releasing her, it will be as teacher and pupil, you in your doctor's gown, and I a learner at your feet. Put your old faith in me into your argument, and we shall have all Pianora converted. He hastened away through the dim gardens, carrying a boy's heart in his breast. End of Book Four Part 9The Valley of Decision by Edith Wharton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Four, Part Ten. The University of Pianoro was lodged in the ancient Signoria or town hall of the free city, and here, on the afternoon of the Duke's birthday, the civic dignitaries and the leading men of the learned professions had assembled to see the doctorate conferred on the signorina fulvia vivaldi and on several less conspicuous candidates of the other sex the city was again in gala dress early that morning the new constitution had been proclaimed with much firing of cannon and display of official fireworks but even these great news and their attendant manifestations had failed to enliven the populace who instead of filling the streets with their usual stir hung massed at certain points, as though curiously waiting on events. There are few sights more ominous than that of a crowd thus observing itself, watching in inconscient suspense for the unknown crisis which its own passions have engendered. It was known that His Highness, after the public banquet at the palace, was to proceed in state to the university, and the throng was thick about the palace gates and in the streets betwixt it and the signoria. Here the square was close-packed, and every window choked with gazers, as the duke's coach came in sight, escorted meagerly by his equiaries and the half-dozen light horse that preceded him. The small escort and the marked absence of military display perhaps disappointed the splendor-loving crowd, and from this cause or another scarce a cheer was heard as his highness descended from his coach and walked up the steps to the porch of the ancient carved stone where the faculty awaited him. 
the hall was already filled with students and graduates and with the guests of the university through this grave assemblage the duke passed up to the row of armchairs beneath the dais at the farther end of the room trescori who was to have attended his highness had excused himself on the plea of indisposition and only a few gentlemen in waiting accompanied the duke but in the brown half-light of the old gothic hall their glittering uniforms contrasted brilliantly with the black gowns of the students and the sober broadcloth of the learned professions a discreet murmur of enthusiasm rose at their approach mounting almost to a cheer as the duke bowed before taking his seat for the audience represented the class most in sympathy with his policy and most confident of its success the meetings of the faculty were held in the great council chamber where the rectors of the old free city had assembled and such a setting was regarded as peculiarly appropriate to the present occasion the fact was alluded to with much wealth of historical and mythological analogy by the president who opened the ceremonies with a polysyllabic latin oration in which the duke was compared to apollo hercules and jason as well as to the flower of sublunary heroes this feat of rhetoric over the candidates were called on to advance and receive their degrees the men came first profiting by the momentary advantage of sex but clearly aware of its inability to confer even momentary importance in the eyes of the impatient audience a pause followed and then fulvia appeared against the red-robed faculty at the back of the dais she stood tall and slender in her black cap and gown the high windows of painted glass shed a paleness on her face but her carriage was light and assured as she advanced to the president and knelt to receive her degree the parchment was placed in her hand the furred hood laid on her shoulders then after another flourish of rhetoric she was led to the lectern from which her discourse was to be delivered odo sat just below her and as she took her place their eyes met for an instant he was caught up in the serene exaltation of her look as though she soared with him above wind and cloud to a region of unshadowed calm then her eyes fell and she began to speak she had a pretty mastery of latin and though she had never before spoken in public her poetical recitations and the early habit of intercourse with her father's friends had given her a fair measure of fluency and self-possession these qualities were raised to eloquence by the sweetness of her voice and by the grave beauty which made the academic gown seem her natural wear rather than a travesty of learning odo at first had some difficulty in fixing his attention on what she said and when he controlled his thoughts she was in the height of her panegyric of constitutional liberty she had begun slowly almost coldly but now her theme possessed her one by one she evoked the familiar formulas with which his mind had once reverberated they woke no echo in him now but he saw that she could still set them ringing through the sensibilities of her hearers as she stood there a slight impassioned figure warming to her high argument his sense of irony was touched by the incongruity of her background the wall behind her was covered by an ancient fresco fast fading under its touches of renewed gilding and representing the patron scholars of the medieval world the theologians lawgivers and logicians under whose protection the free city had placed its budding liberties there they sat rigid and sumptuous on their gothic thrones oregon zeno david lycurgus aristotle listening in a kind of cataleptic helplessness to a confession of faith that scattered their doctrines to the winds as he looked and listened a weary sense of the reiterance of things came over him for what were these ancient manipulators of ideas prestidigitators of a vanished world of thought but the forebearers of the long line of theorists of whom fulvia was the last inconscient mouthpiece the new game was still played with the old counters the new jugglers repeated the old tricks and the very words now pouring out in defense of the new cause were but mercenaries scarred in the service of its enemies for generations for centuries man had fought on crying for liberty dreaming it was won waking to find himself the slave of the new forces he had generated burning and being burnt for the same beliefs under different guises 
calling his instinct ideas and his ideas revelations destroying rebuilding falling rising mending broken weapons championing extinct illusions mistaking his failures for achievements and planting his flag on the ramparts as they fell and as the vision of this inveterate conflict rose before him odo saw that the beauty the power the immortality dwelt not in the idea but in the struggle for it his resistance yielded as this sense stole over him and with an almost physical relief he felt himself drawn once more into the familiar current of emotion yes it was better after all to be one of that great unconquerable army though like the trojans fighting for a phantom helen they might be doing battle for the shadow of a shade better to march in their ranks endure with them fight with them fall with them than to miss the great enveloping sense of brotherhood that turned defeat into victory as the conviction grew in him fulvia's words regained their lost significance through the set mask of language the living thoughts looked forth old indeed as the world but renewed with the new life of every heart that bore them she had left the abstract and dropped to concrete issues to the gift of the constitution the benefits and obligations it implied the new relations it established between ruler and subject and between man and man odo saw that she approached the question without flinching no trace remained of the trembling woman who had clung to him the night before her old convictions repossessed her and she soared above human fears so engrossed was he that he had been unaware of a growing murmur of sound which seemed to be forcing its way from without through the walls of the ancient building as fulvia's oration neared its end the murmur rose to a roar startled faces were turned toward the doors of the council chamber and one of the duke's gentlemen left his seat and made his way through the audience odo sat motionless his eyes on fulvia he noticed that her face paled as the sound reached her but there was no break in the voice with which she uttered the closing words of her peroration as she ended the noise was momentarily drowned under a loud burst of clapping but this died in a hush of apprehension through which the outer tumult became more ominously audible the equerry re-entered the hall with a disordered countenance he hastened to the duke and addressed him urgently your highness he said the crowd has thickened and wears an ugly look there are many friars abroad and images of the mountain virgin are being carried in procession will your highness be pleased to remain here while i summon an escort from the barracks odo was still watching fulvia she had received the applause of the audience with a deep reverence and was now in the act of withdrawing to the inner room at the back of the dais her eyes met odo's she smiled and the door closed on her he turned to the equerry there is no need of an escort he said i trust my people if they do not trust me but your highness the streets are full of demagogues who have been haranguing the people since morning the crowd is shouting against the constitution and against the signorina vivaldi a flame of anger passed over the duke's face but he subdued it instantly go to the signorina vivaldi he said pointing to the door by which fulvia had left the hall assure her that there is no danger but ask her to remain where she is till the crowd disperses and request the faculty in my name to remain with her the equerry bowed and hurried up the steps of the dais while the duke signed to his other companions to precede him to the door of the hall as they walked down the long room between the close-packed ranks of the audience the outer tumult surged threateningly toward them near the doorway another of the gentlemen in waiting was seen to speak with the duke your highness he said there is a private way at the back by which you may yet leave the building unobserved you appear to forget that i entered it publicly said odo but your highness we cannot answer for the consequences the duke signed to the ushers to throw open the doors they obeyed and he stepped out into the stone vestibule preceding the porch the iron-barred outer doors of this vestibule were securely bolted and the porter hung back in a fright at the order to unlock them your highness the people are raving mad he said flinging himself on his knees odo turned impatiently to his escort 
unbar the doors, gentlemen, he said. The blood was drumming in his ears, but his eye was clear and steady, and he noted with curious detachment the comic agony of the fat porter's face and the strain and swell of the equerry's muscles as he dragged back the ponderous bolts. The doors swung open and the duke emerged. Below him, still with that unimpaired distinctness of vision which seemed a part of his heightened vitality, he saw a great gesticulating mass of people. They packed the square so closely that their own numbers held them immovable, save for their swaying arms and heads. And those whom the square could not contain had climbed to porticos, balconies, and cornices, and massed themselves in the neck of the adjoining streets. The handful of light horse who had escorted the duke's carriage formed a single line at the foot of the steps, so that the approach to the porch was still clear but it was plain that the crowd, with its next movement, would break through this slender barrier and hem in the duke. At Odo's appearance the shouting had ceased and every eye was turned on him. He stood there, a brilliant target, in his laced coat of peach-colored velvet, a hand on his jeweled sword-hilt. For a moment sovereign and subjects measured each other, and in that moment Odo drank his deepest draught of life. He was not thinking now of the Constitution or its opponents. His present business was to get down the steps and into the carriage, returning to the palace as openly as he had come. He was conscious of neither pity nor hatred for the throng in his path. For a moment he regarded them merely as a natural force to be fought against like storm or flood. His clearest sensation was one of relief at having at last some material obstacle to spend his strength against, instead of the impalpable powers which had so long beset him. He felt, too, a boyish satisfaction at his own steadiness of pulse and eye, at the absence of that fatal inertia which he had come to dread. So clear was his mental horizon that it embraced not only the present crisis, but a dozen incidents leading up to it. He remembered that Trescori had urged him to take a larger escort, and that he had refused on the ground that any military display might imply a doubt of his people. He was glad now that he had done so. He would have hated to slink to his carriage behind a barrier of drawn swords. He wanted no help to see him through this business. The blood sang in his veins at the thought of facing it alone. The silence lasted but a moment. Then an image of the mountain virgin was suddenly thrust in air, and a voice cried out, Down with our lady's enemies! We want no laws against the friars! A howl caught up the words and tossed them to and fro above the seething heads. Images of the virgin, religious banners, the blue and white of the Madonna's colors, suddenly canopied the crowd. We want the Barnabites back! sang out another voice. Down with the free thinkers, yelled a hundred angry throats. A stone or two sped through the air and struck the sculptures of the porch. Your Highness, cried the equerry, who stood nearest and would have snatched the duke back within doors. For all answer, Odo stepped clear of the porch and advanced to the edge of the steps. As he did so, a shower of missiles hummed about him, and a stone struck him on the lip. The blood rushed to his head and he swayed in a sudden grip of anger, but he mastered himself and raised his laced handkerchief to the cut. His gentlemen had drawn their swords, but he signed to them to sheath again. His first thought was that he must somehow make the people hear him. He lifted his hand and advanced a step, but as he did so a shot rang out, followed by a loud cry. A lieutenant of the light horse, infuriated by the insult to his master, had drawn the pistol from his holster and fired blindly into the crowd. His bullet found a mark, and the throng hissed and seethed about the spot where a man had fallen. At the same instant Odo was aware of a commotion in the group behind him, and with a great plunge of the heart he saw Fulvia at his side. She still wore the academic dress, and her black gown detached itself sharply against the bright colors of the ducal uniforms. Groans and hisses received her, but the mob hung back as though her look had checked them. Then a voice shrieked out, Down with the atheists! We want no foreign witches! And another caught it up with a yell, She poisoned the weaver's boy! Her father was hanged for murdering Christian children! The cry set the crowd in motion again, and it rolled toward the line of mounted soldiers at the foot of the steps. The men had their hands on their holsters, 
but the duke's call rang out no firing and drawing their blades they sat motionless to receive the shock it came dashed against them and dispersed them only a few yards lay now between the people and their sovereign but at that moment another shot was fired this time it came from the thick of the crowd the equerry's swords leaped forth again and they closed around the duke and fulvia save yourself sir back into the building one of the gentlemen shouted but odo had no eyes for what was coming for as the shot was heard he had seen a change in fulvia a moment they had stood together smiling undaunted hands locked and wetted eyes then he felt her dissolve against him and drop between his arms a cry had gone out that the duke was wounded and a leaden silence fell on the crowd in that silence odo knelt lifting fulvia's head to his breast no wound showed through her black gown she lay as though smitten by some invisible hand so deep was the hush that her least whisper must have reached him but though he bent close no whisper came the invisible hand had struck the very source of life and to these two in their moment of final reunion with so much unsaid between them that now at last they longed to say there was left only the dumb communion of fast clouding eyes a clatter of cavalry was heard down the streets that led to the square the equerry sent to warn fulvia had escaped from the back of the building and hastened to the barracks to summon a regiment but the soldiery were no longer needed the blind fury of the mob had died of its own excess the rumor that the duke was hurt brought a chill reaction of dismay and the rioters were already scattering when the cavalry came in sight their approach turned the slow dispersal into a stampede a few arrests were made the remaining groups were charged by the soldiers and presently the square lay bare as a storm-swept plain though the people still hung on its outskirts ready to disband at the first threat of the troops it was on this solitude that the duke looked out as he regained the sense of his surroundings fulvia had been carried to the audience chamber and laid on the dais her head resting on the velvet cushions of the ducal chair she had died instantly shot through the heart and the surgeons summoned in haste had soon ceased from their ineffectual efforts for a long time odo knelt beside her unconscious of all but one wild moment when life at its highest had been dashed into the gulf of death thought had ceased and neither rage nor grief moved as yet across the chaos of his being all his life was in his eyes and they drew up drop by drop the precious essence of her loveliness for she had grown beneath the simplifying hand of death strangely yet most humanly beautiful life had fallen from her like the husk from the flower and she wore the face of her first hopes the transition had been too swift for any backward look any anguished rendering of the fibres and he felt himself not detached by the stroke but caught up with her into some great calm within the heart of change he knew not how he found himself once more on the steps above the square below him his state carriage stood in the same place flanked by the regiment of cavalry down the narrow streets he saw the brooding cloud of people and the sight roused his blood they were his enemies now he felt the warm hate in his veins they were his enemies and he would face them openly no closed chariot guarded by troops he would not have so much as a pane of glass between himself and his subjects he descended the steps bade the colonel of the regiment dismount and sprang into his saddle then at the head of his soldiers at a foot pace he rode back through the packed streets to the palace in the palace courtyard and vestibule were thronged with courtiers and lackeys he walked through them with his head high the cut on his lip like the mark of a hot iron in the dead whiteness of his face at the head of the great staircase maria clementina waited she sprang forward distraught and trembling her face was blanched as his you are safe you are safe you are not hurt she stammered catching at his hands a shudder seized him as he put her aside odo odo she cried passionately and made as though to bar his way he gave her a blind look and passed on down the long gallery to his closet. End of Book Four, Part Ten.
The Valley of Decision by Edith Wharton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Four, Part Eleven, The Last Chapter. The joy of reprisals lasted no longer than a summer storm. To hurt, to silence, to destroy, was too easy to be satisfying. The passions of his ancestors burned low in Odo's breast. Though he felt Brasiaforte's fury in his veins, he could taste no answering gratification of revenge. And the spirit on which he would have spent his hatred was not here or there as an embodied faction, but everywhere as an intangible influence. The aqua tofana of his enemies had pervaded every fibre of the state. The mist of anguish lifted, he saw himself alone among ruins. For a moment Fulvia's glowing faith had hung between him and a final vision of the truth, and as his convictions weakened, he had replaced them with an immense pity, an all-sufficing hope. Sentimental verbiage, he saw it clearly now. He had been the dupe of the old word-jugglery which was forever confounding fact and fancy in men's minds, for it was essentially an age of words. The world was drunk with them, as it had once been drunk with action, and the former was the deadlier drug of the two. He looked about him languidly, letting the facts of life filter slowly through his faculties. The sources of energy were so benumbed in him that he felt like a man whom long disease had reduced to helplessness, and who must laboriously begin his bodily education again. Hate was the only passion which survived, and that was but a deaf, intransitive emotion coiled in his nature's depths. Sickness at last brought its obliteration. He sank into gulfs of weakness and oblivion, and when the rise of the tide floated him back to life, it was to a life as faint and colorless as infancy. Colorless, too, were the boundaries on which he looked out, the narrow enclosure of white walls opening on a slit of pale spring landscape. His hands lay before him white and helpless on the white coverlet of his bed. He raised his eyes and saw de Crucis at his side. Then he began to remember. There had been preceding intervals of consciousness, and in one of them, in answer perhaps to some vaguely uttered wish for light and air, he had been carried out of the palace and the city to the Benedictine monastery on its wooded knoll beyond the Piana. Then the veil had dropped again, and his spirit had wandered in a dim place of shades. There was a faint sweetness in coming back at last to familiar sights and sounds. They no longer hurt like pressure on an aching nerve. They seemed rather now the touch of a reassuring hand. As the contact with life became closer and more sustained, he began to watch himself curiously, wondering what instincts and habits of thought would survive his long mental death. It was with a bitter, almost pitiable disappointment that he found the old man growing again in him. Life, like a mocking hand, brought him the cast-off vesture of his past and he felt himself gradually compressed again into the old passions and prejudices. Yet he wore them with a difference. They were a cramping garment rather than a living sheath. He had brought back from his lonely voyaging a sense of estrangement deeper than any surface affinity with things. As his physical strength returned and he was able to leave his room and walk through the long corridors to the outer air, he felt the old spell which the life of Monte Cassino had cast on him, the quiet garden with its clumps of box and lavender between paths converging to the statue of St. Benedict, the cloisters paved with the monks' nameless graves, the traces of devotional painting left here and there on the weather-beaten walls like fragments of prayer in a world-worn mind. These formed a circle of tranquilizing influences in which he could gradually reacquire the habit of living. He had never deceived himself as to the cause of the riots, he knew from Gamba and Andrioni that the liberals and the court, for once working in unison, had provoked the blind outburst of fanaticism which a rasher judgment might have ascribed to the clergy. The Dominicans, bigoted and eager for power, had been ready enough to serve such an end, and some of the beggaring orders had furnished the necessary points of contact with the people. But the movement was at bottom purely political and represented the resistance of the privileged classes to any attack on their inherited rights. As such, he could no longer regard it as completely unreasonable. 
he was beginning to feel the social and political significance of those old restrictions and barriers against which his earlier zeal had tilted. Certainly in the ideal state the rights and obligations of the different classes would be more evenly adjusted. But the ideal state was a figment of the brain. The real one, as Crescenti had long ago pointed out, was the gradual and heterogeneous product of remote social conditions, wherein every seeming inconsistency had its roots in some bygone need, and the character of each class, with its special passions, ignorances, and prejudices, was the sum total of influences so ingrown and inveterate that they had become a law of thought. All this, however, seemed rather matter for philosophic musing than for definite action. His predominant feeling was still that of remoteness from the immediate issues of life. The soiva incognatio had been succeeded by a great calm. The soothing influences of the monastic life had doubtless helped to tide him over the stormy passage of returning consciousness. His sensitiveness to these influences inclined him for the first time to consider them analytically. Hitherto he had regarded the church as a skillfully adjusted engine, the product of human passions scientifically combined to obtain the greatest sum of tangible results. Now he saw that he had never penetrated beneath the surface, for the church which grasped, contrived, calculated, struggled for temporal possessions, and used material weapons against spiritual foes, this outer church was nothing more than the body which, like any other animal body, had to care for its own gross needs, nourish, clothe, defend itself, fight for a footing among the material resistances of life, while the soul, the inner animating principle, might dwell aloof from all these things in a clear medium of its own. To this soul of the church his daily life now brought him close. He felt it in the ordered beneficence of the great community in the simplicity of its external life and the richness and suavity of its inner relations. No alliance based on material interests, no love of power working toward a common end, could have created that harmony of thought and act which was reflected in every face about him. Each of these men seemed to have found out something of which he was still ignorant. What it was, de Crucis tried to tell him as they paced the cloisters together, or sat in the warm stillness of the budding garden. At the first news of the Duke's illness, the Jesuit had hastened to Pianora. No companionship could have been so satisfying to Odo. De Crucis's mental attitude toward mankind might have been defined as an illuminated charity. To love men or to understand them is not as unusual as to do both together, and it was the intellectual acuteness of his friend's judgments that made their Christian amenity so seductive to Odo. The highest claim of Christianity, the Jesuit said one morning as they sat on a worn stone bench at the end of the sunny vine walk, is that it has come nearer to solving the problem of men's relationship to each other than any system invented by themselves. This, after all, is the secret principle of the Church's vitality. She gave a spiritual center of equality to mankind long before the philosophers thought of giving them a material one. If all the while she has been fighting for dominion, arrogating to herself special privileges, struggling to preserve the old lines of social and legal demarcation, it has been because for nigh two thousand years she has cherished in her breast the one free city of the spirit, because to guard its liberties she has had to defend and strengthen her own position. I do not ask you to consider whence comes this insight into the needs of man, this mysterious power over him. I ask you simply to confess them in their results. I am not of those who believe that God permits good to come to mankind through one channel only, and I doubt not that now and in times past the thinkers whom your highness follows have done much to raise the condition of their fellows. But I would have you observe that where they have done so, it has been because, at bottom, their aims coincided with the churches. The deeper you probe into her secret sources of power, the more you find there in the gems, if you will, but still potentially active, all those humanizing energies which work together for the lifting of the race, 
in her wisdom and her patience she may have seen fit to withhold their expression to let them seek another outlet but they are there stored in her consciousness like the archetypes of the platonists in the universal mind it is the knowledge of this the sure knowledge of it which creates the atmosphere of serenity that you feel about you from the tilling of the vineyards or the dressing of a beggar's sores to the loftiest and most complicated intellectual labor imposed on him each brother knows that his daily task is part of a great scheme of action working ever from imperfection to perfection from human incompleteness to the divine completion this sense of being not straws on a blind wind of chance but units in an ordered force gives to the humblest christian an individual security and dignity which kings on their thrones might envy but not only does the church anticipate every tendency of mankind alone of all powers she knows how to control and direct the passions she excites this it is which makes her an auxiliary that no temporal prince can well despise it is in this aspect that i would have your highness consider her do not underrate her power because it seems based on the commoner instincts rather than on the higher faculties of man that is one of the sources of her strength she can support her claims by reason and argument but it is because her work like that of her divine founder lies chiefly among those who can neither reason nor argue that she chooses to rest her appeal on the simplest and most universal emotions as in our towns the streets are lit mainly by the tapers before the shrines of the saints so the way of life would be dark to the great multitude of men but for the light of faith burning within them meanwhile the shufflings of destiny had brought to trescori the prize for which he waited during the duke's illness he had been appointed regent of pianora and his sovereign's reluctance to take up the cares of government had now left him for six months in authority the day after the proclaiming of the constitution odo had withdrawn his signature from it on the ground that the concessions it contained were inopportune the functions of government went on again in the old way the old abuses persisted the old offences were condoned it was as though the apathy of the sovereign had been communicated to his people centuries of submission were in their blood and for two generations there had been no warfare south of the alps for the moment men's minds were turned to the great events going forward in france it had not yet occurred to the italians that the recoil of these events might be felt among themselves they were simply amused spectators roused at last to the significance of the show but never dreaming that they might soon be called from the wings to the footlights to de crucis however the possibility of such a call was already present and it was he who pressed the duke to return to his post a deep reluctance held odo back he would have liked to linger on in the monastery leading the tranquil yet busy life of the monks and trying to read the baffling riddle of its completeness at that moment it seemed to him of vastly more importance to discover the exact nature of the soul whether it was in fact a metaphysical entity as these men believed or a mere secretion of the brain as he had been taught to think than to go back and govern his people for what mattered the rest if he had been mistaken about the soul with a start he realized that he was going as his cousin had gone that this was but another form of the fatal lethargy that hung upon his race an effort of the will drew him back to pianora and made him resume the semblance of authority but it carried him no farther trescori ostensibly became prime minister and in reality remained the head of the state the duke was present at the cabinet meetings but took no part in the direction of affairs his mind was lost in a maze of metaphysical speculations and even these served him merely as some cunningly contrived toy with which to trick his leisure his revocation of the charter had necessarily separated him from gamba and the advanced liberals he knew that the hunchback ever scornful of expediency charged him with disloyalty to the people but such charges could no longer wound the events following the duke's birthday had served to crystallize the schemes of the little liberal group 
and they now formed a campaign of active opposition to the government, attacking it by means of pamphlets and lampoons, and by such public speaking as the police allowed. The new professors of the university, ardently in sympathy with the constitutional movement, used their lectures as means of political teaching, and the old stronghold of dogma became the center of destructive criticism. But as yet these ideas formed but a single live point in the general numbness. Two years passed in this way. North of the Alps all Europe was convulsed, while Italy was still but a sleeper who tosses in his sleep. In the two Sicilies, the arrogance and perfidy of the government gave a few martyrs to the cause, and in Bologna there was a brief revolutionary outbreak. But for the most part the Italian states were sinking into inanition. Venice, by recalling her fleet from Greece, let fall the dominion of the sea. Twenty years earlier Genoa had basely yielded Corsica to France. The Pope condemned the French for their outrages on religion, and his subjects murdered Basseville, the agent of the new republic. The sympathies and impulses of the various states were as contradictory as they were ineffectual. Meanwhile, in France, Europe was trying to solve at a stroke the problems of a thousand years. All the repressed passions which civilization had sought, however imperfectly, to curb, stalked abroad, destructive as flood and fire. The great generation of the encyclopedists had passed away, and the teachings of Rousseau had prevailed over those of Montesquieu and Voltaire. The sober sense of the economists was swept aside by the sound and fury of the demagogues, and France was become a very babel of tongues. The old malady of words had swept over the world like a pestilence. To the little Italian courts, still dozing in fancied security under the wing of Bourbon and Habsburg suzerains, these rumors were borne by the wild flight of immigres, dead leaves loosened by the first blast of the storm. Month by month they poured across the Alps in ever-increasing numbers, bringing confused, contradictory tales of anarchy and outrage. Among those whom chance thus carried to Pianora were certain familiars of the Duke's earlier life, the Count Alfieri and his royal mistress flying from Paris and arriving breathless with the tale of their private injuries. To the poet of revolt this sudden realization of his doctrines seemed in fact a purely personal outrage. It was as though a man writing an epic poem on an earthquake should suddenly find himself engulfed. To Alfieri the downfall of the French monarchy and the triumph of democratic ideas meant simply that his French investments had shrunk to nothing, and that he, the greatest poet of the age, had been obliged, at an immense sacrifice of personal dignity, to plead with a drunken mob for leave to escape from Paris. To the wider aspect of the tragic farce, as he called it, his eyes remained obstinately closed. He viewed the whole revolutionary movement as a conspiracy against his comfort, and boasted that during his enforced residence in France he had not so much as exchanged a word with one of the French slaves, instigators of false liberty, who, by trying to put into action the principles taught in his previous works, had so grievously interfered with the composition of fresh masterpieces. The royal pretensions of the Countess of Albany, pretensions affirmed rather than abated as the tide of revolution rose, made it impossible that she should be received at the court of Pianora. But the Duke found a mild entertainment in Alfieri's company. The poet's revulsion of feeling seemed to Odo like the ironic laughter of the fates. His thoughts returned to the midnight meeting of the honeybees, and to the first vision of that face which men had lain down their lives to see. Men had looked on that face since then, and its horror was reflected in their own. Other fugitives to Pianora brought another impression of events, that comic note which life, the supreme dramatic artist, never omits from her tragedies. These were the Duke's old friend, the Marquis de Courvoulon, fleeing from his chateau as the peasants put the torch to it, and arriving in Pianora destitute, gouty, and middle-aged, but imperturbable and epigrammatic as ever. With him came his marquis, a dark-eyed lady, stout to unwieldiness and much given to devotion, in whom it was whispered, though he introduced her as the daughter of a Venetian senator, that a reminiscent eye might still detect the outline of the gracefulest columbine who ever flitted across the Italian stage. These visitors were lodged by the duke's kindness in the Palazzo Servino, near the ducal residence. 
and though the ladies of Pianoro were inclined to look askance on the Marquise's genealogy, yet his highness's condescension and her own edifying piety had soon allayed these scruples, and the salon of Madame de Courvoulon became the rival of Madame d'Albanie's. It was, in fact, the more entertaining of the two, for in spite of his lady's austere views, the Marquis retained that gift of social flexibility that was already becoming the tradition of a happier day. To the Marquis, indeed, the revolution was execrable not so much because of the hardships it inflicted as because it was the forerunner of social dissolution. The breaking up of the regime, which had made manners the highest morality and conversation the chief end of man, he could have lived gaily on a crust in good company and amid smiling faces. But the social deficiencies of Pianora were more difficult to endure than any material privation. In Italy, as the Marquis had more than once remarked, people loved, gambled, wrote poetry, and patronized the arts, but alas, they did not converse. Courvoulon could not conceal from his highness that there was no conversation in Pianora, but he did his best to fill the void by the constant exercise of his own gift in that direction, and to Odo at least his talk seemed as good as it was copious. Misfortune had given a finer savour to the Marquis's philosophy, and there was a kind of heroic grace in his undisturbed cultivation of the amenities. While the Marquis was struggling to preserve the conversational art, and Alfieri planning the savage revenge of the Misogallo, the course of affairs in France had gained a wider impetus. The abolition of the nobility, the flight and capture of the king, his enforced declaration of war against Austria, the massacres of Avignon, the sack of the Tuileries, such events seemed incredible enough till the next had crowded them out of mind. The new year rose in blood and mounted to a bloodier noon. All the old defenses were falling. Religion, monarchy, law were sucked down into the whirlpool of liberated passions. Across that sanguinary scene passed like a mocking ghost the philosopher's vision of the perfectibility of man. Man was free at last, freer than his would-be liberators had ever dreamed of making him. And he used his freedom like a beast. For the multitude had risen, that multitude which no man could number, which even the demagogues who ranted in its name had never seriously reckoned with, that dim, groveling, indistinguishable mass on which the whole social structure rested. It was as though the very soil moved, rising in mountains or yawning in chasms about the feet of those who had so long securely battened on it. The earth shook, the sun and moon were darkened, and the people, the terrible unknown people, had put in the sickle to the harvest. Italy roused herself at last. The emissaries of the new France were swarming across the Alps, pervading the peninsula as the Jesuits had once pervaded Europe, and in the mind of a young general of the Republican army, visions of Italian conquest were already forming. In Pianora, the revolutionary agents found a strong Republican party headed by Gamba and his friends, and a government weakened by debt and dissensions. The air was thick with intrigue. The little army could no longer be counted on, and a prolonged bread riot had driven Trescori out of the ministry and compelled the duke to appoint Andrioni in his place. Behind Andrioni stood Gamba and the radicals. There could be no doubt which way the fortunes of the duchy tended. The duke's would-be protectors, Austria and the Holy See, were too busy organizing the hasty coalition of the powers to come to his aid, had he cared to call on them. But to do so would have been but another way of annihilation. To preserve the individuality of his state, or to merge it in the vision of united Italy, seemed to him the only alternatives worth fighting for. The former was a futile dream, the latter seemed for a brief moment possible. Piedmont, ever loyal to the monarchical principle, was calling on her sister states to arm themselves against the French invasion, but the response was reluctant and uncertain. Private ambitions and petty jealousies hampered every attempt at union. Austria, the Bourbons, and the Holy See held the Italian principalities in a network of conflicting interests and obligations that rendered free action impossible. Sadly, Victor Amadeus armed himself alone against the enemy. Under such conditions, Odo could do little to direct the course of events. They had passed into more powerful hands than his. 
but he could at least declare himself for or against the mighty impulse which was behind them the ideas he had striven for had triumphed at last and his surest hold on authority was to share openly in their triumph a profound horror dragged him back the new principles were not those for which he had striven the goddess of the new worship was but a bloody maenad who had borrowed the attributes of freedom he could not bow the knee in such a charnel house tranquilly resolutely he took up the policy of repression he knew the attempt was foredoomed to failure but that made no difference now he was simply acting out the inevitable the last act came with unexpected suddenness the duke woke one morning to find the citadel in the possession of the people the impregnable stronghold of Braciaforte was in the hands of the serfs whose fathers had toiled to build it, and the last descendant of Braciaforte was virtually a prisoner in his palace. The revolution took place quietly, without violence or bloodshed. Andrioni waited on the duke, and a cabinet council was summoned. The ministers affected to have yielded reluctantly to popular pressure all they asked was a constitution and the assurance that no resistance would be offered to the french the duke requested a few hours for deliberation left alone he summoned the duchess's chamberlain the ducal pair no longer met save on occasions of state they had not exchanged a word since the death of fulvia vivaldi odo sent word to her highness that he could no longer answer for her security while she remained in the duchy and that he begged her to leave immediately for vienna she replied that she was obliged for his warning but that while he remained in pianora her place was at his side it was the answer he had expected he had never doubted her courage but it was essential to his course that she should leave the duchy without delay and after a moment's reflection he wrote a letter in which he informed her that he must insist on her obedience no answer was returned but he learned that she had turned white and tearing the letter in shreds had called for her travelling carriage within the hour he sent to inquire when he might take leave of her but she excused herself on the plea of indisposition and before nightfall he heard the departing rattle of her wheels he immediately summoned andrioni and announced his unconditional refusal of the terms proposed to him he would not give a constitution or promise allegiance to the french the minister withdrew and odo was left alone he had dismissed his gentleman and as he sat in his closet a sense of death-like isolation came over him never had the palace seemed so silent or so vast he had not a friend to turn to de crucis was in germany and trescori it was reported had privately attended the duchess in her flight the waves of destiny seemed closing over odo and the circumstances of his past rose poignant and vivid before his drowning sight and suddenly in that moment of failure and abandonment it seemed to him again that life was worth the living his indifference fell from him like a garment the old passion of action awoke and he felt a new warmth in his breast after all the struggle was not yet over though piedmont had called in vain on the italian states an italian sword might still be drawn in her service if his people would not follow him against france he could still march against her alone old memories hummed in him at the thought he recalled how his piedmontese ancestors had gone forth against the same foe and the stout donna's blood began to bubble in his veins a knock roused him and gamba entered by the private way his appearance was not unexpected to odo and served only to reinforce his new-found energy he felt that the issue was at hand as he expected gamba had been sent to put before him more forcefully and unceremoniously the veiled threat of the ministers but the hunchback had come also to plead with his master in his own name and in the name of the ideas for which they had once laboured together he could not believe that the duke's reaction was more than momentary he could not calculate the strength of the old associations which now that the tide had set the other way were dragging odo back to the beliefs and traditions of his caste the duke listened in silence then he said discussion is idle i have no answer to give but that which i have already given he rose from his seat in token of dismissal 
The moment was painful to both men. Gamba drew nearer and fell at the Duke's feet. "'Your Highness,' he said, "'consider what this means. We hold the state in our hands. If you are against us, you are powerless. If you are with us, we can promise you more power than you ever dreamed of possessing.' The Duke looked at him with a musing smile. "'It is as though you offered me gold in a desert island,' he said. "'Do not waste such poor bribes on me. I care for no power but the power to wipe out the work of these last years. Failing that, I want nothing that you or any other man can give.' Gamba was silent a moment. He turned aside into the embrasure of the window, and when he spoke again it was in a voice broken with grief. "'Your Highness,' he said, "'if your choice is made, ours is made also. "'It is a hard choice, but these are fratricidal hours. "'We have come to the parting of the ways.' "'The Duke made no sign, and Gamba went on with gathering anguish. "'We would have gone to the world's end with your Highness for our leader.' "'With a leader whom you could lead.' Odo interposed. He went up to Gamba and laid a hand on his shoulder. "'Speak out, man,' he said. "'Say what you were sent to say. Am I a prisoner?' The hunchback burst into tears. Odo, with his arms crossed, stood leaning against the window. The other's anguish seemed to deepen his detachment. "'Your Highness! Your, your, your Highness!' Gamba stammered. The duke made an impatient gesture. Come, make an end, he said. Gamba fell back with a profound bow. We do not ask the surrender of your highness's person, he said. Not even that, Odo returned with a faint sneer. Gamba flushed to the temples, but the retort died on his lips. Your highness, he said, scarce above a whisper, the gates are guarded, but the word for tonight is humilitas he knelt and kissed odo's hand then he rose and passed out of the room before dawn the duke left the palace the high emotions of the night had ebbed he saw himself now in the ironic light of morning as a fugitive too harmless to be worth pursuing his enemies had let him keep his sword because they had no cause to fear it Alone he passed through the gardens of the palace and out into the desert darkness of the streets. Skirting the wall of the Benedictine convent where Fulvia had lodged, he gained a street leading to the marketplace. In the pallor of the waning light the ancient monuments of his race stood up mournful and deserted as a line of tombs. The city seemed a graveyard and he the ineffectual host of its dead past. He reached the gates and gave the watchword, the gates were guarded as he had been advised, but the captain of the watch let him pass without show of hesitation or curiosity. Though he made no effort at disguise, he went forth unrecognized, and the city closed her doors on him as carelessly as on any passing wanderer. Beyond the gates, a lad from the ducal stables waited with a horse. Odo sprang into the saddle and rode on toward Pontesordo. The darkness was growing thinner and the meagre details of the landscape with its huddled farmhouses and mulberry orchards began to define themselves as he advanced. To his left the fields stretched gray and sodden, ahead on his right hung the dark woods of the ducal chase. Presently a bend of the road brought him within sight of the keep of Pontesordo. His way led past it toward Valsecca, but some obscure instinct laid a detaining hand on him, and at the crossroads he bent to the right and rode across the marshland to the old manor house. The farmyard lay hushed and deserted. The peasants who lived there would soon be afoot, but for the moment Odo had the place to himself. He tethered his horse to a gatepost and walked across the rough cobblestones to the chapel. Its floor was still heaped with farm tools and dried vegetables, and in the dimness a heavier veil of dust seemed to obscure the painted walls. Odo advanced, picking his way among broken plowshares and stacks of maize, till he stood near the old marble altar with its sea-gods and acanthus volutes. The place laid its tranquilizing hush on him, and he knelt on the step beneath the altar. Something stirred in him as he knelt there, a prayer, yet not a prayer a reaching out, 
obscure and inarticulate, toward all that had survived of his early hopes and faiths, a loosening of old founts of pity, a longing to be somehow, somewhere, reunited to his old belief in life. How long he knelt he knew not, but when he looked up the chapel was full of a pale light, and in the first shaft of the sunrise the face of St. Francis shone out on him. He went forth into the daybreak and rode away toward Piedmont. End of The Valley of Decision by Edith Wharton This LibriVox recording in the public domain was narrated by Robert Kuyper.